Could you please state your name for the camera? I'm Frank O'Keefe. And Mr. O'Keefe, you recently moderated a panel um, as part of air capture and its applications in closing the carbon cycle, where you were on the panel for photosynthesis in plants. Um, could you tell us a bit about your involvement that brought you to this spot? Well, I've, I've followed uh, Klaus Lackner and his research for uh, much of the last 12 and a half years uh, and have uh, had uh, a, a sustained interest in air capture as a solution to many problems. Uh, as you know, I've, I've uh, started a company called Infinitry, which will utilize uh, Klaus's proven technology uh, to capture carbon from ambient air and release it in greenhouses to enhance plant growth and its fruit. It's, uh, it's uh, the, the vegetables that uh, the plants create in greenhouses and, uh, and that will be uh, our first effort uh, which I, I described at the conference uh, and, uh, and that's my current interest in, in uh, carbon capture. So why greenhouses? Well, greenhouses require um, uh, a five percent stream of, of of CO2, which is what uh, we can provide using the existing technology, and uh, so we wanted to take what exists and put it to work now, as opposed to uh, pursue other applications uh, that require further research, further work and maybe years down the road before we can actually uh, mobilize them. But more importantly, we're focused on, on cultivation as a challenged art, uh, and we're focused on demographics as a challenging outcome that we have to face as people. Uh, we are home to 7 billion people today uh, in, in uh, very few years, by 2050, we will be home to 9 billion people, perhaps 9.5 billion. Uh, we don't have the land uh, to grow food to feed those people. We don't have the water to irrigate crops for those people. So we need to be more efficient in how we use water and how we use land. And uh, greenhouses achieve that. Uh, they use considerably less water than field cultivation and they result in uh, considerably enhanced yields uh, from seven uh, fold to 35 fold, depending on the foodstuffs raised. So you spoke a little bit about using captured carbon to feed the greenhouses. What else makes Affinitry unique? Well, we, we are uh, unique in that we're going to work on the, on the program today. Uh, we, we, uh, we will uh, seek uh, to, to put uh, Klaus's technology to work in existing greenhouses uh, where farmers are uh, raising uh, food uh, for wide distribution, but we will also look to markets that have yet to, to really be uh, addressed. Uh, we, we look to cities uh, and rooftop farming as a, as a real potential growth area for us. Uh, because we want to diminish uh, the carbon footprint of the food we eat. Uh, today, uh, food from, from the crop uh, to the fork uh, travels about 1,500 miles on average, and that's too much. Uh, we'd rather have it move a couple of blocks. Uh, so we, we're, we're looking to, uh, to enhance uh, our, our carbon footprint to diminish it, and we want to uh, both uh, utilize the technology in existing industrial farm applications as well as to focus on uh, new areas where we think uh, uh, we can make significant inroads like uh, rooftop farming in cities. Excellent. So you're speaking a little bit about some real impacts that you can consider on the triple bottom line. You talk about reducing the greenhouse footprint and also feeding more people and of course making a profit. How do all these things come together and inspire a greater movement that gets investors to even think more in these terms? Well, it's a, it's a wonderful question. I think the triple bottom line is, is a new phrase and it shouldn't be. 
uh, we need to focus beyond uh, just profits. We need to focus on people. We need to focus on the future. Uh, and we need to know that, uh, that what we do today impacts it, not for our grandchildren, not for our great-grandchildren, but for our immediate children and for ourselves if we're to be long-lived. So we, we, uh, we, we view our interest in carbon capture as addressing a, a core issue for humanity today and for the planet. We, we have a 400 parts per million uh, CO2 content in the atmosphere today. It's too much. Uh, we, we know that, uh, that feedback loops are in process. We know that, that uh, the Earth is holding more heat. Uh, and, and that's a scary thing uh, for us because it increases the likelihood of uh, deserts growing it diminishes uh, uh, the success of, of a great deal of farmland where drought has become an increasing reality. Uh, so we need to address that. We need to insulate our food uh, supply, increasing our food security by immunizing uh, cultivation from Mother Nature's threats, threats that appear to be increasing as uh, carbon content increases on the planet. Uh, so we think that this is basic. We think that we're addressing risks that, uh, that are real and present. Uh, we think that uh, focusing on food is the right thing to do because it's, uh, it's a need that is, is present uh, for many populations today. We have enough food here in the United States. Many of us do, but many societies don't. And uh, we need to address that. And uh, we, can, we can start by making our farmlands more productive, as I said, seven to 35 fold, uh, depending on the, the, the crops raised by moving into greenhouses. That's excellent. So you've identified a lot of opportunities for this type of technology and really is a leading technology to start pushing society to think about becoming carbon negative. Where do you see when we might sit down five years from now, this type of technology and how do you see Infinitry as leading the curve? It's a great question because right now, uh, this this application will be uh, carbon neutral, uh, perhaps slightly carbon reductive. Why? Because today farmers uh, and hobbyists, we define hobbyists as garden growers who utilize carbon to enhance growth, they're burning fuel to enhance carbon atmospheres inside their greenhouses. In other words, they're taking fuel, burning it, and adding to the CO2 problem to enhance uh, growth inside the greenhouses. That's carbon additive. What we're going to do is capture, capture carbon from ambient air and off-gas that carbon inside of, of greenhouses and, and at the very least neutralize, potentially improve for some period of time, uh, the, the carbon footprint of cultivation. Downstream, uh, we have uh, interest in investing in uh, research concerning sequestration, some of it going on right here at Columbia and at Lamont Doherty. Uh, so that's been one of the commitments in our business plan, is to invest in research uh, to, to actually uh, Im improve the carbon content by, by rendering uh, uh, certain of our, of our businesses uh, carbon reductive. Now, a lot of businesses, especially when it gets to sustainable technologies or sustainable enterprises, look to the government to provide certain subsidies to at least sweeten the deal. Now, when we see a lot of subsidies going toward renewable energy that ostensibly will offset greenhouse gases, where do you see technology such as this receiving government support where it creates a public good? Well, it's important. Uh, your own Jim Hansen has said that uh, we can do so much personally. We can do so much as businesses invest in, in improving, improving the, the, the CO2 content of the atmosphere. But to really succeed, we need policy. We need government investment. Clearly, we've seen that in the war on cancer since the 70s as, as uh, investment from uh, the United States government has driven research uh, most recently with, with, the, uh, with focus on the genome 
and uh, the ability to, to understand how to uh, diminish risk uh, for those with uh, certain uh, genetic uh, profiles. We uh, view government involvement as crucial. Uh, we see that it's a difficult uh, task, but we are already at work doing that. We are working with a lobbyist. Uh, we have been to uh, uh, Washington on a number of occasions to, to explain what we're up to, and we are seeking their support. We think that their support uh, should be forthcoming. Uh, that's that's uh, stated aspirationally, though. We're hopeful. So, what keeps you up at night? What really stands in the way? You say this is, you know, our, our life at Infinitry would be a lot easier if this challenge weren't in the way. And what do you see as some of the biggest challenges or maybe threats to this endeavor? Well, I'm I'm kept up at night uh, by the 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 research that uh, many of your scientists have done as regards climate. Uh, I'm kept up at night. Uh, by the potential uh, that we won't succeed. Uh, we do know that feedback loops are at play today. We do know that the albedo effect has uh, diminished as the ice caps have diminished in size, and therefore the oceans are absorbing more heat, uh, causing uh, uh, a rise in, uh, in sea levels. Uh, we we recognize that uh, deserts are increasing. Uh, we also recognize that uh, farmland essential to our existence has experienced horrendous drought in the past uh, three years, most, uh, most uh, poignantly, as we saw in the Midwest in 2012, as we're seeing in California right now. Uh, so I fear that we will not succeed. Uh, but I, I, I'm actually uh, calmed by conversations with Klaus Lackner and his colleagues who are studying means to solve this problem with science. Uh, we think it will be solved with science. Uh, there is no other way around it. Uh, we continue to burn fossil fuels. Uh, to stop that uh, causes uh, a number of impacts in the economy uh, that are impossible. So therefore, what do we have to do? We have to uh, try and capture it at the source of, of, uh, of, of our emissions, but we also need to capture uh, the extra that some scientists are saying we have to capture in order to diminish those feedback loops uh, and potentially to, uh, to render them uh, mute. So we're, that's what we're, we're, we're hoping to do. We view uh, two to three parts per million as being challenge one. We need to take that out of the air. But we also know that uh, Hansen and others have said that uh, 400 parts per million is untenable. Uh, therefore, we have to move to 350. That's what he says may enable us to quiet uh, the, the feedback loops. Uh, so that's instructive, instructive to us. What it means is we have to find a way to take 50 parts per million out of the air. Now that, of course, is a lot of carbon, and we need a place to put it. So that's one of our challenges. It's one of the, the areas of research that we hope to plow money into as we, uh, as we succeed in the greenhouse uh, sphere. Both inspiring and fearful words. Um, so I guess, close, closing thoughts, it's, it's a massive endeavor. It takes what many policy pr experts have said is to put a social cost on carbon or for society really to say we're willing to pay this much because it's going to cost us this much in the future. Um, how do you see if and when that price comes into play as that inspiring more businesses like Infinitry and what do you think it's going to take for people to realize that? Sadly, We've, we've seen events that uh, can potentially be tied to climate change. Uh, those events uh, enable us to put some price tag on uh, uh, extreme weather. We, we know uh, from, from, from Hansen, from Broker, from, 
from Lackner and others that extreme weather is more likely from Gore. Uh, the, the extreme weather is more likely the more moisture there is in the air. And that's a reality uh, today with increased carbon. Uh, and as a result, there's, there's, there's more energy in the air giving rise to, to more extreme storms. We think that we have all the information we need uh, to move ahead. We understand that it's a touchy, touchy subject, but we also understand that as a society we've done well by hedging our bets, by hedging our risks. For us to say, uh, well, we don't know enough, uh, as, a, as a reason for not doing anything, is terribly dangerous in my view. What we have to do is to recognize that what we know requires us to act. It requires us to act now because uh, it's what we don't know that's most frightening. What don't we know? We don't know uh, what will happen to the ice sheets uh, in Greenland. We, we don't know how quickly they will erode. We do know that they're eroding today. Uh, and if they do erode, what the result will be. Uh, but we know that there are hundreds of millions of people uh, in Bangladesh uh, that live at, at, at very few feet above sea level, and uh, we know that they would not be able to live there should those ice sheets uh, cease to be. Uh, where will they go? The, the misery that could result uh, from us failing uh, to address this now, uh, before these changes transpire, uh, would be, uh, excuse the drama, the, the drama of this word, but uh, irresponsible. We ourselves have uh, major cities uh, that are exposed, uh, the city we're sitting in among them. Uh, so I think that the potential costs of, of climate change are so high that they require us, uh, require action to hedge our bets. Uh, we require at this time uh, an attempt uh, to hedge uh, for those who doubt that this is real, to hedge that there's a possibility it might be. And if you attach that to property value loss, human misery cost, uh, that number is astronomical. Uh, so we need to address it today, and we can, with, with Klaus Lackner's research uh, and others uh, like him focused on the problem from other Facets. Thank you.